name's uh, Justin Lyons and I'm a senior officer for land management um, for Natural Resources Wales. A um, bit of a, a long title, but my primary role is on um, the Dovey National Nature Reserve, um, which I've been working here um, for since 1996. Um, most of those years um, working alongside um, Mike Bailey, who retired about this time last year. So, yeah, so I hope I uh, give a good talk and do the, do the site justice. Um, so the Dovey National Nature Reserve, as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, before I carry on, uh, am I speaking loud enough for everyone? I'm quite softly spoken, so I tend to be quite soft. Is that loud no, enough? No, it seems fine because people can always up the volume anyway on their own um, screen. Okay. So, yeah. There we go. Great. So the Dovey National Nature Reserve um, is composed of um, three um, sort of areas I always think of. So there's uh, Anislaus Sand Dunes. Um, and the intertidal areas around it, um, which thousands and thousands of people come to every year. Um, then there's the estuary itself. Um, not many people venture onto that um, with all its sand flats, mud flats and tidal creeks and the, uh, and the actual um, course of the River Dovey and the Larry where it comes into it as well. And of course, the uh, fantastic lowland raised bog of Korswachno, which is going to be the focus of the talk tonight. Um, and yeah, and Fiona, if I go on too long, please just butt in and tell me to <laughs> stop. <laughs> okay. So, if we're here at midnight, you better let me know. Um, so what I thought, I thought I'd sort of do it as broad as possible. So um, what I'm going to talk about is um, introduce the site itself, a bit about um, the, the past activities on the site, um, and then about a little bit about the history of the conservation of the site and then a lot about the restoration that's been going on here for nigh on 50 years and the rest probably and then a little bit about the the, the future of the site as well so first of all um the importance of course Wachno as a site of high conservation value has been known well, since the early 1900s and there were visits from um, botanists such as Salter um, there was some work done by a chap called Yap who was looking at um, peat levels and then um, Godwin a little bit later on was doing some interesting work on the stratigraphy of the site um, and this was followed in the middle of the 20th century by numerous studies by um, various universities but particularly the University College of Wales Aberystwyth and um, I was looking at some old record, old um, text about the site, and even in, in a report from the 1960s, it was said that there were 15 universities or, and institutions that regularly visited the site, and that's certainly been carried on since that day, since that time, um, and now we, we host many university groups, A-level groups, um, and so forth. So it's 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 always been a very important uh, site for um, study. I, I, as an undergraduate at um, Aberystwyth here, um, came came to um, Korsrochno with Andrew Agnew, and I, and I can st I can still remember that the first time I came here. So it's a you know it's a really important site um, to raise awareness uh, of the importance of of the conservation of the site, but also about the ecology of all the fascinating species that we have here. Um, so the protection of course for, you know, for its nature conservation and scientific interest has been long and, and often protracted as it quite often is in the conservation of site of, um, of conservation sites um, and that all sort of started with the designation as a site of special scientific interest in the 1954. Um, and we have many organizations and individuals um, to thank for their determination to ensure the protection and restoration of one of the best remaining lowland raised bogs in the UK. And um, I thought it was quite sort of fitting um, giving this talk now to the South and West Wales Wildlife Trust that are hosting it, that it was um, in the early 1970s that the West Wales Naturalist Trust, a, a precursor of, the, of, the, of the, the modern day trust, played a key role in the process of um, protecting the site. They actually bought part of the raised bog. Um, at the time, Nature, Cons Nature Conservancy weren't able to do that. They're apparently too busy. Um, and 
yeah, so the, the West Wales Naturalist Trust bought part of the site, I think it was something like 100 acres or so, and they later passed that on to uh, Nature Conservancy. So yeah, so it's very fitting that uh, I'm giving this talk tonight. So just a little bit about the sort of current designation of the site. So um, of course, Rockingham is, is part of a much larger um, triple SI called the W triple SI, which encompasses oh, you know nearly not far off 4,000 hectares. It's a, it's a massive area, and that includes me, many uh, other areas that aren't within the NNR. So that would include that areas such as uh, Anishira, for instance. Um, it's a Ramsar site, so it's an international uh, wetland designated site. Um, it's part of the UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. And also it's part of, it is the Korswachno Special Area of Conservation. So 650 hectares of the lowland raised bog it is a European designated site. And as, as I mentioned, it's part of the uh, Dovey National Nature Reserve. Um, so why, why, why is Korswachno important? Um, so in the UK, um, to date, we've lost 94% of our lowland raised bog habitat in the UK. Um, this is this picture. I can't. I, I, I took the picture, but I can't remember the name of the site, unfortunately. But it's in um, uh, north north of Cumbria, just not far off the Scottish borders. So this is a, a site that um, Natural England are managing. Um, but obviously it doesn't look that interesting at that, at that point in time. So this area has been commercially mill, milled for peat and you know it's, it's uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of hectares of bare peat. So they, they had a massive life project there um, in, an, in an attempt to restore that to back to lowland race bog. That's a, that's a few hundred year project I would imagine. So uh, here we go. Here's a here's a little graph. Um, it's quite an old graph now. So um, even even by the 19, 1970s, then we'd already lost 85% of our lowland raised bog, and now now we're down to sort of 94%. So it's a very very um, threatened habitat. Um, being in the UK, we're in a good place for lowland raised bog because as we go on to see in a, in a little while. Um, our temperate climate um, and, and a very, very wet nature, particularly in the, on the west side of the UK for England and Wales, a little bit of a different pattern uh, in Scotland. You know, we're a really, really good place for lowland raised bog. So it's, it's really important that uh, we conserve the remaining 6%. And Korswachno is one of the best remaining sites. And as we're going on to see, even though it's one of the best remaining sites, it's still um, had a lot of uh, activity on in the past that has damaged it and threatened some of the wildlife. Um, so here's, here's a um, view looking um, from the south towards the estuary and in the middle ground is, is Korswachno. Um, I'm going to have a go with my phone. I don't know where they're Oops. having a bit of an issue with my... Uh, can you see the... There we go. So it, in the sort of central area here, this area here, this is what's called the sort of primary surface of the bog. So it's the area of the bog that, that remains that hasn't been damaged and it equates to about 190 hectares. So if you think back to the 652 hectares of um, special area of conservation, then about a third of that is, is bog that hasn't been damaged. All the rest have had some um, activity um, in the past that has, has damaged it in some ways and we'll look a little bit about that in a little bit. Um, so I'm going to just initially I'm not going to sort of talk about all, all the terrible things, not terrible things, but all the activities that have gone on in the past that have damaged it. I'm just going to show you some of the primary uh, area of the bog that has had um, the least amount of damage just to show you some of the fantastic things that we, we find, find on those areas. So this is a, a, a bleak aerial shot and it shows the sort of very central area of the bog. You can see we have a, um, a boardwalk that goes across, uh, across the site there. And you can see one thing that strikes you is, is that there's a sort of passing uh, arrangement of the vegetation. There's sort of yellows, uh, more lightish green areas than darker areas. 
and that patterning is very characteristic of, of, a, of a bog in a reasonably healthy condition and that's only to be found on, on the primary area. So when later on when we talk about sort of objectives of how we'd like it to look then uh, that's one of the key key factors that we look for is this um, sort of what we call um, mosaic. So what makes up that mosaic um, or surface patterning is another word for it. So on the left uh, hand uh, picture you can see that there are sort of sort of uh, this photo must have been taken in in the winter they're sort of bright not bright dark yellow areas and these are areas of um, sphagnum lawn and they're characterized on Korsrochno um, by one species of sphagnum called sphagnum pulchrum and I believe pulchrum the specific name um, means beautiful so this is the beautiful sphagnum um, and it has a bright gold and yellow co color and it's in the right hand on the right hand picture at the bottom of the screen you can see that beautiful yellow color so looking into this vegetation here if somebody said oh i manage a bog say in uh, in cumbria somewhere and this is the vegetation i've got then i i would be i would i wouldn't be jealous because i know that we've got it here but i'd be thinking that looks a piece of bog that's in a really good really good condition so you can see there's um, lawns of sphagnum pulchrum you can see that uh, in the middle area there are sort of reddish areas and there are areas of other types of sphagnum um, things like um, what used to be called sphagnum magellanicum which is now median um, in there as well and then going up towards the heather area areas then you get another species of sphagnum called sphagnum papillosum so different sphagnums like different conditions. So, um, and it's what we call the microtopography of the surface of the bog. And the more microtopography you have, the better the condition of the bog. Um, so here we go, here's another picture. And for a bog to be in really good condition in this part of the world, then we have um, various types of microtopography. So we have, um, what's called mud bottoms, which is the obviously the brownish areas. And at the bottom of those, there's not much growing in those areas. Um, you can see some a few um, shoots of bog bean. Um, and then as you come towards the shallow of the pool area, you have another type of sphagnum um, that grows in the water called sphagnum cuspidatum. And I can remember Andrew Agnew when we went out saying, oh, this one's called drown kittens. Uh, I think when I give talks these days, I call it wet kittens because I think it's, <laughs> it's maybe a little bit unacceptable. Um, but anyway, it was funny at the time. So um, that likes to grow in the, in the wetter areas. And then creeping up out of that, we have our sphagnum pulchrum that form, likes to form nice lawns. And then going up a little bit, we either have, um, some people call it um, carpets, some people call it low hummocks. We have things like um, sphagnum papillosum or sphagnum median, which is the sort of red one. And then on an absolutely pristine bog, then you'd have much bigger hummocks of some of the really, really, really rare, rare species. So on Korswachno, we are indeed fortunate to have some of those really, really rare species. Um, going back to the pulchrum, pulchrum is a very restricted sphagnum in, in the UK um, and we have masses of it here on Crosswalk now so we're, we're really pleased about that and then we have these two hummock species sphagnum bayotuk which used to be called um, fuscum for those who might be um, have heard of it before and sphagnum mustenii which is the one on the right and these species form large hummocks and they can be they can be up to sort of 50 centimeters above the water table we'll go on to the water table in a little bit but that's the the whole key to um the the to what a lowland raised bog is a very very high water table so some species like the cuspidate and the drowned kittens they they like it um just growing in open water or very very shallow water um some species like it a little bit higher um, just just a few centimeters above the water table so that's like the pulchrum and then we get the low hummocks where we get papillos and, and median and then um, we get these big hummocks of these uh, very specialist species like ostenii 
and uh, bayer tuck which can grow you know they can grow 50 centimeters above the level of um, where say where the poultry grows and they can form massive hummocks several meters wide on, on a really um, pristine bog of course Rockno isn't pristine anymore so um, we don't have we don't well we have two or three really really large hummocks or stenii that that uh, are attain that sort of size um, but if you were to go to Ireland then there's there's a few areas that I know where, where you still can get to see those as well. Um, the top picture of um, the, the very dark brown one is called it, that's the Bayer Tuck one. Um, what we what you do find I, I, only, I was reading about this the other day is that when you get these big hummocky species um, as I say, different species are associated with different heights above the water table. Sometimes what happens is sometimes you can get some species that sort of piggyback onto the bayer tuck. So the golden little golden stars in amongst the bayer tuck, those ones there, those are actually pulchrum and they're sort of, they're not in the right place. But because these hummock species are so good at drawing water up by capillary action um, from from the water from the water below, then these species like pulchrum can just they can just sort of just survive within the hummocks by sort of linking on to the uh, capillary action from these uh, big hummock species. But they're only going to ever be uh, able to be there as as little individuals. They would never be able to spread out because because they're quite, as you can see from the lower picture, where you can see the, amongst the bog bean, they're quite a loose hummock and they would just lose too much water if they were on top of the hummock and there was lots of them. So there we go. So there, there's a few species of sphagnum there. Um, and, the, and these species are, have really, really restricted um, um, distribution. So bayer tuck um, is, of course, Rockland is its is only uh, Welsh location. Um, as you go up into Scotland, it does become more, more common. Um, and Ostenia is only found um, at one other site within Wales. It's found at um, some of the uh, relic raised bogs um, around Trowels Funnet, but I think it's just, just two hummocks there. And a bit later on, I'll go a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the monitoring that we've been doing for these species uh, in the last uh, year. Um, there we go. And just, just a taster of some of the other plants that we get here. So uh, as you'd expect, the cotton grasses. So we have common cotton grass and hare's tails cotton grass on site. Um, in profusion in places, we have the probably the most beautiful flower uh, of, of the bog, um, bog asphodel. Um, not so common in the in the central area, but particularly common in, in uh, not so much in the sort of middle fringes, I suppose, is, is, is one way of putting it. And then we have the lovely bog rosemary. And then uh, the bottom left picture, you can see the cross leaved heath. Um, that, that's sort of ubiquitous across all of the site. Um, this the picture there is is on is on on the sort of fringes of the site because there's lots of millionaire amongst it. Um, and we're fortunate enough to have um, all three species of the of sundew that you can find in the UK, and also a hybrid. So the um, top left picture is. Uh, great sundew and this is almost exclusively found on those um, uh, sphagnum pulchrum lawns that I was talking about so it's in, in amongst the golden sphagnum and you can see a few of the little um, you can see a few little black dots on there where they've caught um, little midges or something but sometimes you know lucky enough you might you'll see them though they've caught a they apparently can catch dragonflies. I've never seen them catch a dragonfly, but I've certainly seen them uh, seen damselflies attached to them. And then the picture to the right, uh, the one in the water, is um, um, intermediate sundew, and uh, this sort of grows in two sort of locations, of course, Rockno. Um, from um, descriptions of what a perfect bog looks like, then it should grow um, in, in the edges of one of those mud bottoms I showed a minute ago. But here on Korsvochno, it tends to grow either in some of the rest restoration areas where we sort of um, have shallow flooding, like in this picture that you can see here, you can see it, and just above it, you can see some of the um, uh, 
the uh, wet kittens or sphagnum cuspidatum. It likes it in those areas or on some of the peripheral areas that we graze, it quite often likes to say we've created a scrape where there's a bit of bare peat. It, quite often, it really likes those sort of areas as well. And in those areas, sometimes it creates actual lawns um, and the sort of action of the grazing livestock sort of maintain the sort of bit of disturbance there. And um, it seems to like colonizing those areas. And probably one of the one of my sort of favourite stories about sundews is once taking out a, a local primary school, was, um, um, a school reader Penai, um, and we were in one of the fields and I went to go and show them the sundews, um, the species um, next to a, one of the grazing plots. And there was a whole was sort of like a lawn of sundew there, of uh, intermediate sundew. And an unfortunate um, damselfly, I, I think it was, um, uh, yeah, it would have been an azure damselfly. Uh, a female had landed on there and sort of got stuck and was struggling away. And obviously, those of suitors had come to were attracted to it, and they were literally I don't know. There must have been at least twenty uh, dying or dead um, uh, dam damselflies uh, caught in in this sundew. The the children were a mixture of aghast and fascination. So, yeah, that's that's a lovely one. And then the bottom one is the commoner um, round leaf sundew. I think this one looks like it's uh, caught a crane fly, um, that one there. And again, this, this, I think virtually all the pictures I've got today, apart from the few birds I put in, because I can't take pictures of birds, are, I've been taken by uh, staff on, on, on site. So they're all, all from site. So this one's on, on one of the edge fields and you can see that because it's got um, marsh penny wort in amongst it, some sedges. And I can't see what, oh yeah, and there's a bit of Bob Pimpernel amongst that as well. And then the bottom left picture um, is one that I hadn't seen until uh, uh, last year. Um, and the last record was, I think was from 2002 when Arthur Chater saw it, is a, a hybrid sundew. It's a hybrid between um, great sundew and round leaf sundew. Um, if anybody was called Drosera obovata, it's called. Um, and uh, yeah, so, it grows wherever both parent plants grow. And this year, I think I found four individuals and our peatland surveyor, Dave Reed, found two plants of it as well. So I think, I think if you really search for it, you probably, you probably find a lot more of it. So yeah, so that's really exciting to have all three and the hybrid as well. So that's, that's really great. And again, all, but particularly great sundew are very restricted species in Wales. Um, intermediate's not that common either, and I think we're the only location um, currently where um, the hybrid grows. So that's fantastic. Um, I wasn't going to show this slide here, but um, I'll go back to that one in a minute. <laughs> um, so here we go. So all this wonderful um, raised bog vegetation that I've just sort of showed a, showed bits of is a, a wonderful place for a whole fantastic uh, diversity of rare invertebrates um, many of which are restricted to this sort of habitat um, so I've got an example of a few here and a bit later on I'll, I'll mention a few others so we have um, the small red damselfly um, that, that is uh, common uh, across much of the site um, we have a tiny little jumping spider called Helianthus damphii um, I think that was the first place in the UK was on course Faulkner that it was identified at. Um, subsequently been found at um, several raised bogs in Cumbria and in Scotland. Um, we're one of the few places in uh, in Wales where you will see bog bush crickets and they're, they're common throughout the site and also um, raft spider uh, as well. So they're as you can see on, on the picture here, there's one on, on the boardwalk and they guard the boardwalk. Um, so if you're lucky enough to walk around on our visitor boardwalk on the north side, particularly sort of from now onwards um, in spring, this time of year is a really, really good time to actually see them. So you, I would say if you went out in a, in, a, in a few weeks time, you'd be guaranteed to see one if, you, if it was on a, a reasonably um, sunny day. So fantastic insects, not insects spiders right um so 
So that's that. Oops. Right. Um, before I go on to the sort of, I think, yeah, I thought now what I'd do was sort of talk uh, a bit about uh, about how the bog has formed over the last few thousand years. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to go back to my, otherwise it's going to be too far to go back, I'm going to go back to Miss Sphagnum, Sphagnum uh, slide. I sort of thought I'd moved it, but I've forgotten I haven't. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about sphagnums. So um, um, at, at, at Korsvokno, we have a, an amazing 17 species of sphagnum, which is, which is a fantastic total. It went up by a couple this year, and we had a surveyor on site um, doing some um, uh, so, um, um, condition monitoring of the uh, special area of conservation, and he found an additional two species. So that was very exciting. I wonder if we can maybe get it up to 20. We'll see. Um, so the sphagnum mosses are really the sort of habitat engineers of, of, um, of a raised bog. And, and that's because of, of the properties that they have. So they're absolutely fantastic. Um, as you can see from the right hand picture, um, if you grabbed a whole uh, handful of sphagnum and squeezed it out, you'll get huge quantities of water. And the reason why they're so good at holding on to water is to do with um, their sort of morphology and their and their and their structure as well. So they they are able to trap water um, between their leaves and between the branches and and each branch is sticking to the stem as well. And uh, so they the water trap they don't trap water doesn't travel internally throughout the moss. They actually travels um, by capillary reaction between the leaves and uh, between the branches of the what the leaves are on and uh, against the stem as well. So that's one way that they hold on to water. And the other way is by the, the structure. So if you were to look at one of their tiny leaves, you'd find uh, they're just one cell thick, the leaves, and they're made up of rows of living cells and big ginormous dead cells. And the dead cells have little pores in them, and then they have um, thickening to stop the, the, these big dead cells collapsing and uh, water is able to move into these big dead cells and it's held onto the sides of the cell wall by um, various physical things uh, properties called um what's it called hydrogen bonding in uh, in the water and it's held there nice and tightly and then between the big dead cells then there's the little living cells that do the photosynthesizing so in the center of the bog um we have um about eight or nine species that are characterize it and I've mentioned most of those species and then as you go out towards the fringes of the bog where the conditions are slightly different there might be a bit more water movement there might be a few more minerals and so forth um, and uh, you get a slightly different uh, range of species in those areas so so not only are they really good at holding on to water they're actually really really good at grabbing hold of nutrients as well and in that process they acidify and, and change the environment so what they do is they're able to grab hold of the few nutrients that are available on site um, by throwing out uh, acidic ions they produce an acid and they exchange them um, for um, neg uh, negative ions things like nitrate ions and so forth and um, they're able to grab hold of those and then use those to make it their protein and so forth so we'll we'll go on about how the bog grows and i'll go back to some of those um characteristics in a minute so if we go back to um the last ice age um I think we're going in the opposite direction at the moment but um so if we go back 10 12 000 years ago at the end of the last ice age then um Korshochno, where it is now would have sat uh, uh, there would have been a um, over deepened valley between um, the hills um, just above Borth and on the other side of the estuary um, above Abu Dhabi. And over time, then that uh, um, over deepened glacial valley would have been would have been infilled um, by material coming down the estuary um, and material coming in from the sea as well. Um, and that would have covered the uh, floor of the estuary with this blue estuarine clay. And over time, we would have been left with a um, large flat estuarine plain. There would have been some outcrops in it, things, areas like Timaur, 
um, and some of the areas down towards Ennislas as well, um, where the bedrock sticks up. Um, and then going northwards from Borth, um, we would have had a shingle spit forming. At this time, the, then that pro, then the shingle spit would have perhaps been a lot further, uh, would have been further out to sea because the uh, sea level was a lot lower at that point in time. So as time went on, um, the uh, sheltered area, as, as, the, as the ground was building up, um, would have been, the level of the ground would have been building up more and more, and the area would have been getting colonized by some species. You would have had some um, salt marsh species. You would have maybe ha started to have some brackish species, such as um, common reed, um, forming this large estuarine plain. Um, and this, this would have built up to such a degree as, um, that you would have started eight hundred, eight to 900 years ago. You would have started to start have areas of wet woodland. Um, in some of the drier areas, you would have started having oaks coming in as well. Um, so here we go. Um, my colleagues in the Life Project have done this, uh, this, this creation, so I'm very grateful <laughs> for them for doing that. Um, so we, you can see the solid geology below, the clay on top, and then the sort of open water. And then we have this sort of infilling and we would, in the wet woodland, we would have started to have um, wet peat form, wood peat formed. So peat, um, which I'm going to talk a lot about, is um, basically um, partially or sometimes wholly undecomposed plant material. So because of the very wet nature of, of, the, um, of the ground, um, because it's very flat and the drainage is very poor, then some of the plant material um, will, because it's so wet, there's not enough oxygen there, so decomposition is very slow and would start to be build up. So we would have, start to have wood peat starting to form. Um, then um, 8,000 years ago, then the, the climate started to change, it became a lot wetter. Um, and this was the sort of, um, the starting point for Korsvokhno um, as we know it today starting to form. So as it got wetter then uh, it became more and more unsuitable um, for the trees to grow and one species that really took advantage of this was the uh, was the sphagnum mosses. Um, and so what as it grows um, it's able to hold on to the water, it's able to um, grab hold of nutrients um, by its um, exchange mechanism um, and gradually more and more peat would start to accumulate. Um, and so over time, you can see from this diagram here, um, gradually it becomes divorced from the surrounding geology and forms a sort of mound. So the sort of red area where it says sphagnum peat in the middle is where the, as the sphagnum grows up, it remains um, because it's the water level is so high, um, it, it um, doesn't decompose. And also another factor as well, because when, when I mentioned earlier, the fact that the uh, sphagnum produces acids, that also um, decreases the rate of decomposition. And some of the key species, um, particularly the hummock species like Papillosum, medium, capillifolium, and Beatuck and Ostenii, they're particularly good at producing these acids and they are very resistant um, to decay. So the mixture of the very high water table, excluding a lot of the decomposers, the very acidic nature of, of the um, sphagnum remains, allow the peat to start to grow up. And so after, uh, over the last seven to 8,000 years, we've had an accumulation, uh, well, it, it's generally about seven meters in the center, but there are some little pockets where it's a little bit deeper. So over that period of time, then this huge mound of peat, um, commonly seven meters deep, has accumulated over that amount of time. So I often, I mean, I'm sure everybody, everybody does this. We often wonder, because we live in a, a country that is so um, altered by the activities of man, I quite often sort of think, I wonder what it looked like several thousand years ago. Well, wonder what that valley looked like. Wonder what the wildwood looked like. Wonder what the uplands looked like. Um, 
before um, major activities of man had, had, had changed some of the habitats and, and I've certainly done the same for um, Korswokno and the neighbouring um, uh, ecotones, the transitions between the raised bog and say the salt marsh and the sand dune and you, I sort of dream about what it may have looked like um, several hundred years ago before um, activities of man have, have it, had influenced it. So the nearest we have um, to that, obviously we can look back into, into the peat um, stratigraphy to see what it looked like, but the nearest only, only um, thing we have to have some idea of, of what, what the, what the uh, area looked like is, is this map here. So this is a map that was uh, made about 230 years ago and you can see sort of Korsvokno um, towards the bottom in, see if I think there. But even 230 years ago, you can already see we've started um, to dig ditches along here on the western fringes, fringes of the site where it goes down into the sand dunes. Um, so even 230 years ago, then, then there were some activities that would have influenced. And, it, and going northwards, we would have had at the edge of the bog, we would have had um, outcrops such as um, Anis um, Vokhno, which I think is um, what we call now call um, Timauer, um, sticking out. And then going a little bit north of there, then you would have gradually had a transition between Lowland Ray's Bog and um, Brackish Mire, and then going down into salt, salt Marsh as well. And you'd have had a similar arrangement going westwards as well. And um, from this um, picture, this map here, um, you can see the, the River Lerry and the Avon Lerry um, originally didn't used to, now it comes out, I'll show you in a, in a map in a minute, comes out into the River Dovey, but uh, 230 years ago, then it used to come out um, what I call Anislas Turn. So just if you go on the road north of Borth um, to Anislas Turn, where you turn off to come down to Anislas, um, where there's the uh, car park on the edge of the golf course, so the River Dovey, River, sorry, the River Larry used to come out there. So it used to come towards Borth um, from Anasafurgi by Anasafurgi Church, not too far from the Animalarium, if anybody knows that. And then it would um, go parallel to the coast um, and it would cross the road um, just as a Cambrian Coast caravan site, um, which is there now. You can actually see the old course of it where, where the reeds are, and then it would come out at. Um, uh, at on this last turn there, but that that all changed in the early 1800s. So we'll we'll see a map of that in a second. So here, here's a map showing some of the main habitat types that we um, think would have been the main distinctive uh, ones in, in the area. So you can see the main sort of central area of lowland raised bog, of course, Rochno, and then further up the area uh, of the estuary, there would have been other um, areas of lowland raised bog. So the, the, there's some still some remnants there at Anisadil, uh, to Covered Cork, at, on uh, the RSPB reserve, and and even more going further um, south east. And then fringing a lot of the site, there would have been areas of sort of poor fen and marsh and fen woodland and reed swamp as well. Uh, and then you would have um, gradation into sort of brackish mire and then going into the eventually going down into salt marsh and you do even had a transition between sort of the bog and the fen and the sand dune as well so it would have been a, a, a fantastic um, ecosystem and there are still there are still sort of hints of some some of those transitions on site today and, and quite often they're the sort of loci of some some of the rarer species. So here's an aerial photograph of uh, Korsvokno today um, and one thing that's plainly obvious is is that there's been quite a lot of activity going on. Um, so probably one of the most dramatic changes to, to the lowland raised bog was the cutting of the um, canalization of the river Larry. So instead of um, it's snaking across here and coming out over here. Um, in the early 1800s, 
they decided um, they wanted to restore this area, not restore, they wanted to claim this area here um, for farmland. And I suspect also um, when the River Lerry used to come out along here, I suspect that it, it obviously was it would have been tidal quite a long way up. So um, the, the town of Borth would have been threatened during very high tides, not only from uh, um, the tidal surge coming in from, from the sea, but also the tide coming up along the uh, old Larry Channel. So it would have been flooded on both sides. So I suspect it wasn't just uh, purely um, a claiming of land for agriculture. It was probably trying to protect both to some degree. So this area, this area was claimed. So we call this, this is um, an area called Abilary, more the Borth and Anasafergi here. So this area of the lowland raised bog was sliced off and then the river Larry was canalized through the western fringes of the site and comes out um, they would have had to um, blast rock to go through the last bit to where it comes out into into the river Dovey here so that's would have dramatically affected um, the sort of hydrology of, of the site and how it worked um, so that's one of the biggest changes that we would have seen and then other activities that have gone on are you can particularly see around the southern fringes you can see these sort of if you look closely you can see all see score lines particularly going north south like this and these are all peak or old peak cuttings and these i'll show you another map in a minute um should i go on to that one when well, no that one there we go so i've just sort of marked on the map the areas of peak cutting so they're, they're fairly extensive um they cover at least 350 hectares of the um present day special area conservation but if you were to extend the um the size of the peatland block um the original size of the bog then it would they would cover a much much larger area as well um so vast areas of peat cuttings um a lot of them are centered around common so the area this area here is called Llanquevelen Common and um, obviously people have peat cutting rights here Taliesin Common here the the these um, residents of Taliesin would have had peat cutting rights Turbury rights here and also down in the southwest of the bog there's extensive areas that that were peat cut as well um, and then the, yeah and then these areas um, a lot of these were partitioned up and people would have had peat cutting rights, they would have had slots of land and certainly when we went on to do some of the restoration work which I'll talk about in a, in a, in a little while then you can see people had different styles of cutting and different amounts of peat were removed so some people were messy peat cutters and other, other people were quite tidy about it. Um, I'll just go back to that map and here's a, here's a map um, shortly after the um, uh, the new uh, river Larry was cut and you can see it um let me marker there we go and you can see it going up here and they put uh, tidal flunk flood banks in in along this section as well and these were these, these have been extended at various points over the last sort of 200 years going further back and in the map also you can see some of the um areas of cutting starting to be shown on the map so there's this area here which have been cutting us to supply people from both these ones over here on Clankenville and Common and then these ones down Valnog um, for the people of, of Taliesin. This map um, is the last map that shows um, open water bodies on the centre of the bog which is um, quite fascinating so we have these open water bodies that the map shows here and when we look at um, any later maps, those have completely disappeared. So you can start, you can see that they've started to dig ditches to these pools to try and drain them. Um, so there's no, there's no, there's no hint of them um, that we know of left on the site. Um, but we do have some records, and there's, there's a um, quite a famous engraving. I, I was going to put it up I've, I've forgot to put it in into the talk but there's a fame quite a famous in, engraving called the buzzards um i think it's in uh, arthur well, i know it's in, it's in arthur chater's uh book um uh, the, the flora of caradigian and it shows um it says it's called the buzzards but 
they, they look like marsh harriers. So we're pretty certain they're marsh harriers flo flying over uh, a, a shallow pool that has lots of white water lilies on. So there's, um, so there would have been white water lilies on a lot of these pools, we sort of surmise. But unfortunately, there's no white water lilies left now on Korsvokhno. The last record, I think, was sometime in the 1970s. It was along a ditch line. Um, and I think it was Adrian Fowles that last saw it. So that's a real, it's, a, it's really sad that that's uh, gone. I keep meaning to go and uh, it, it's a six figure good, good reference. So I'd have quite a long, large area to tramp, but I'd be really fascinated to find any relic white water lilies on course Wachner. So maybe, maybe in the future, if we get the management right in a few hundred years time, if uh, sea level rise hasn't got the better of us, then uh, maybe we will have some pools with um, white water lilies on. Um, right, so there's the peak cuttings. Um, oh, actually, I'll just go back a couple of slides. So, so we had peak cutting um, as an activity that has affected the site. Um, we've had drainage. So a lot of that drainage was to assist in um, drying out the area for peak cutting. But as time went on, a lot of the um, drainage was associated with attempts to um, dry out the area for um, grazing um, stock, particularly sheep and cattle. Um, and then during the 1960s, there was a, a consortium that bought out a, a lot of the northwest of the site. So there's my thingy. So this area here, you can see that there's some massive drains that were dug during the 1960s in an attempt to drain this area. And this consortium very much um, wanted to go down the sort of fens idea of, of growing sort of crops like potatoes and so forth. Um, they quickly found out that it was more difficult than they thought to actually drain the area, but they did a huge amount of damage. Uh, I think one consortium sold out to another one and then uh, eventually um, they were, we were, um, the Nature Conservancy and then the Nature Conservancy Council was able to um, buy those areas and uh, start their start the restoration of those and to protect them. But a lot of damage has, has had been done already um, from the digging of those. So these 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 ditches extend right into the middle of the bog. They come they come right up to here, right up to here, and. This one here comes right the way through here and then down to another ditch here. So they've had, they've had a really, really dramatic effect. So the effect of the, the combined effect of peat cutting and drainage ha has caused massive issues in terms of the hydrology of, of the site. Um, so what happens is when you stick a ditch um, or a cutting into peat is that the, the water comes out of it and because the peat's just composed of um, decaying or partially decayed or undecayed plant material, then as soon as oxygen gets in there, it has the opportunity to start to decay and oxidize and it ends up as CO2 in the atmosphere and the pink peat shrinks uh, and goes downwards. Um, and this, this, this has an immediate effect to the side of the ditches but as time goes on, it works its way backwards. So what we end up with, instead of having a big, large raised bog formed by one massive dome um, going from um, west to east and from north to south, the dome, the center of the dome here, which is about six meters above sea level, and it goes down to about 1.8 meters above sea level here, and even less over this way, is that these areas here where we have ditches all around them, the peat actually shrinks around the edges of the ditches. So we end up um, with um, little, little raised bogs in, in effect in these areas because there's been shrinkage all along the sides of the ditches and then oxidation of the peat. So we end up with lots of little tiny, um, tiny little raised bogs all over the place. Um, and that's a real um, issue um, that we've uh, had to try and look at in terms of our restoration and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, right, so the peat cutting and drainage are two of the, the biggest um, uh, factors that have, have altered the bog 
And then another one, um, which um, we sort of forget about about now, and in terms of what how it would have affected the site, site is fire. So up until a few, two or three hundred years ago, um, there's been, I can't remember the name of the researcher now, but there was, um, you're able to look back into the peat, um, you know, be able to take cores. That's the fantastic thing about bogs. You can look at the stratigraphy um, and find out what's happened in the past. And there were very few um, fires across the bog. Fires are, uh, and it can be a natural phenomenon on, on raised bogs. And um, there's been research done into this and the frequency of them. And, and I think it can range from anything to 300 to every 500 years, you would naturally um, have a, a fire event on, on, a, on, a, on a bog. However, in the last, um, from the sort of mid 1800s um, through to about 35 years ago, then um, looking at documentary evidence from um, newspapers, um, from people like, um, um, Salter, people like um, Godwin, and um, um, there was a couple that did a dissertation on the site, Parker, and I can't remember the, his colleague, or her, it was a, he and a she. Um, and then going into more um, into the 70s from um, Fred um, Slater and so forth, then we can tell that there were at least um, fires that covered the whole site approximately every 10 years. And this would have had a, a huge effect on the site as, as a whole. So um, one of the um, um, key people who researched uh, raised bogs and written widely on it in the UK is a chap called Richard Lindsay. And he says, I was reading some of the stuff that he'd written fairly recently. And he was saying that uh, a raised bog would take a, a human lifetime to recover um, from from a, a, a severe burn across it. So if you were to think that it, we had a we had a, an extensive fire every ten years for perhaps the last um, over a hundred years, then we can see that that will have had a dramatic effect on on the uh, on the vegetation cover of the site, and it's particularly the hummock species that would have suffered um, because they're you know they're um, sitting high and dry. And, and they would have been severely affected. And I'll go on to talk about the effect on one particular species in, in a little while. So the last um, major fire on Korsochno was in 1980, brain's gone dead there, 85 or 86. So we're in the longest uh, modern day period of no fires on site. So you can imagine the combination of peat cutting, drainage, and fire has had a dramatic effect on on the uh, on the habitat of, of the lowland raised bog here. And as a consequence of those three um, activities, um, obviously we've seen drying of the site, the lowering of the water table around the periphery, and that would have also um, also affected the the hydrology on the on the central core area where there was very little digging. And we would have had colonization of tree species. So we have birch and willow moving in. They, you know, you would still find birch and willow on a pristine bog, but they would be on the, on the fringes of outcrops, on the very fringe of the site as well. Um, but following these activities, um, then the um, distribution of scrub is, is much, much greater. And then in more recent times, in the last sort of 50 years, then rhododendron has become a problem. Not as huge as it is on, on some other lowland raised bogs, places like Routsey Moss in Cumbria, where it covers, well, it did cover before they removed it, covered um, probably hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of hectares and so forth. But it's still, it, is, it is an issue that we're trying to nip in the bud. And then that one, and that one. Right, and here's, yeah, just a, a summary of um, the, the, the uh, extent of the ditches. So we have 14 kilometers of peripheral, um, deep peripheral drains. Um, and because they form our boundary, um, then it's very difficult for us to um, raise the water table in, in those because we'd be flooding our neighbors. Um, so we've only, we've only been able to raise the water level in any of those, um, only in one kilometer of those. And then internally on the site, we have 23 kilometers of large to medium internal drains. Um, most of those we've been able to dam. So 
the process of um, restoring the bog is very much centered on raising the water table back to uh, as near to natural as possible and obviously that's impossible if you've actually lost a lot of the peat through um, oxidation and shrinkage so since about the um, late 80s early 90s then um, very much the focus has been in terms of conservation and restoration of the site is it all been focused on um, raising back the hydrology to as near to as possible to what it originally was um, and prior to that removing some of the scrub as well because once scrubs are established um, then it's very difficult to get rid of um, so um, my predecessor uh, Mike Bailey was very much um, the uh, one of the key proponents of, of doing a lot of this work of, of raising the water table how am I doing for time um, I, I think uh, probably if you could um, start to wrap up soon would be good. Justin. Okay, yeah, I'm going on a bit, aren't I? <laughs> and by the way, we can't actually see your pointer, so um, oh, oh, most yeah. of it we've been able to tell from your directions, knowing that North is at the top of the screen, but um, it's fine. So, uh, where then? Um, oh, there we go. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh, I, I was doing it on the wrong. So as a consequence of, all, of all, all these actions in the past, then it means that the site is, is no longer in, in, in favorable condition. And um, very much a lot of our work is centered in, on doing this. This is a, a, a condition monitoring. And you can see that um, for a pass rate, um, the percentages that I've shown there needs to be 60% um, for um, the vegetation that, that we're interested in. And you can see the central area here we're sort of getting near to that but as we go out to the fringes then it's very much a lot lower so a lot of our management is, is focused on that so i don't think that's a sort of negative reflection on what we've done in the past it's just a very very long process um, so our site objective is to change it to unfavorable to favorable um, and and to to restore as near as we can to the original shape of the bog so I'm going to flick through. This one takes ages. So this one just show you can see this reflects the contours of the site. I'll have to wait for a second for this one to <laughs> to load because it's a bit of a big image. Um, hopefully it'll change in a second. No, oh, no, it's not doing it. It's frozen. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So he, here we are, and our, our aim is to raise the water table so it's as close to the surface as long as period as time. So that's what this graph shows. And so some of the cuttings, and here's some of the work that we've been doing. So a lot of the cuttings, we've um, put this um, sheet plastic piling in um, to raise the water table, particularly on the, on the southern part of the site. And you can see some of the work we did about 10 years ago here. And here, here's the... Um, uh, product of that. So on the right, you can see upslope of it. You can see there's a fantastic uh, increase in the amount of sphagnum and also um, hairtails, cotton grass. Um, with the Life Project, um, this has enabled us to focus on a new restoration technique that they trialed in Cumbria, where they were using um, uh, excavators to make sh um, shallow um, contour buns. So here's one that um, was done. Um, this last winter um, and we're going we're putting in over 20 kilometers of these so these are just creating a, a shallow um, mound which is from beat peat that's taken from lower down in, in the bog um, that's slightly much more impervious than the surface degraded peat and um, raises the water table up along the contours um, and the focus here is not to create lots of deep waters just to create shallow shallow um, buns and you can see some of the excavator work doing this here um, and this graph shows i won't go into that into detail because it'd take me too long but you can see the extent of some of the cut some of the buns that we're doing here um, this is some work that we did uh, as i say last winter and here again and you can see here these loops were very much focused on doing the contours in association with the um where, where the ditch lines have been done in the past um, we've dammed all the ditches up, but to raise the water table up within 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 these areas, then we've had to do these big loops like this. 
um, and other, other activities that the life uh, funded work, um, so this is the European project work is helping is um, mowing some of the peripheral areas, controlling the rhododendron, scrub control and some community engagement uh, work. Um, one area that I'm partic I have partic been particularly enjoy doing my in my time working on site is on the peripheral areas of the site where we've had a mixture where we can't restore it um, rapidly back to lowland raised bog but we can buffer the hydrology back into into the central area and also create some really fantastic habitats as well so that we're using native breeds to gra graze the periphery of the site the Welsh mountain ponies and so forth and this has created some absolutely fantastic areas um, you know real I would say some of the orchid displays are on a par with on a slash so they're absolutely fantastic areas um, and these are some of the species um, that these grazed areas some of the specialist species like um, lesser water plantain um, really really good peripheral areas now for breeding snipe some specialist species of mosses that only grow on on um, dung and some specialist insects like the hornet robber fly again uh, um, it's, it's associated its larvae is associated with dung as well but it's a it's a predator and just i'm going to quickly go through some of the monitoring stuff so um we're doing various monitoring on site the life project is doing stuff on greenhouse gas monitoring so that's looking at the changes over time um, in relation to um, the work that we've done in raising the water table and hopefully we'll see a reduction in, in green, greenhouse gas emissions. Looking at um, water levels, um, this guy's hoovering, hoovering the bog for spiders to do some monitoring and there's a picture of me there monitoring uh, one of the rare orchids on site. And we've had some looking back at the two rare sphagnums on site, um, sphagnum astenian and bayotuck. Um, then we've seen um, positive changes in in those species in the last 20 years. So uh, Martha Newton did some um, monitoring in a, in a in this um, eight no yeah eight hectare plot no 12 hectare plot um, for Stenii here in both 2000 and 2020, and then it was repeated again um, in um, 2020, and for um, for, um, I'm just, I've written this down because I will never remember it. So for sphagnum um, bayotuck, then we've seen a 192% increase in, in the number of hummocks, in, in the summed area of the hummocks, and 30%, 8% increase in the, in the number of hummocks. So that's a really, really positive, and that's um, um, statistically significant. For Astenia, it's slightly different in that it's so low numbers, it's not statistically um, significant, but there has been a, a, an increase there. So we have, we've gone from 1992 when um, a few, um, Alan Hale and Ray Woods and a chap called Nick Hodgetts, three really good bryologists came to site and tried to refine um, many of the old sites that Fred Slater had found in the early 70s of um, sphagnum uh, ostenii, they only, whereas Fred Slater had found sort of nearly 200, they were only able to find three. Um, now we're up to about 67, so there's a sort of gradual improvement in that one. Beotox seems to be um, recovering much more rapidly. Um, other monitoring we do, so we do um, large heath butterfly monitoring. So we've been doing this since 1986, and you can see here uh, a graph of numbers along the transect, and you can see there's it's been fairly up and down, but it's fairly fairly steady. In the it's it's, a, it's a, there's no um, negative um, results there really, and we're one of the most southerly sites for large heath in the UK. So it's a it's a it's a good indicator. Uh, well, so perhaps this would be an early warning system for any climatic change for that species. And then one of the most famous invertebrates we have on site is the rosy marsh moth. This was a species thought to be extinct in the UK um, and then was um, found in the 1960s. And um, um, it, it feeds, the caterpillar feeds on bog myrtle. Um, and again, we've been monitoring that. So um, the big fire was around um, 1986 and you can see 
following that that's had a dramatic effect on the population but as you can see since then um, numbers have uh, have increased and been very high and not so high but generally greater than uh, in the uh, late 80s and uh, the 90s didn't do it last year covid um and then and then and as today we, we found two new two new species of sphagnum for the site and then in 1999 we were lucky enough to find this fantastic plant irish ladies tresses um with it again a very restricted um distribution in the uk mainly found in the northwest of scotland and in ireland and now down here in wales and we we've been monitoring that and here's a Here's a sort of location map of the of, of all, all the individuals that we found last year. So when we first found it in '99, there were just eight um, um, spikes. It was grazed at that time, so we excluded them um, for la this uh, 2020, and we were up to 24 flowering spikes and seven vegetative um, rosettes. So that's a that's one that we hope will be able to spread on on site. And then reptiles and amphibians is fantastic. It's one of the site features. And again, um, we monitor all those. And that's some of the data there that we have. So last year was really good because we've got the live project going on. Then we were able to increase um, a, a lot of the uh, re records we have on some of the site areas of the sites that we didn't visit so um, frequently. I'm doing a rapid, rapid talk. <laughs> and just finally, um, Koshokno has always been, as I say, an important area for education. And so we, from um, research people here, like this Professor Andy Baird here, has done some really um, important research into how water moves um, in peatlands. Um, to um, Aberystwyth University here, some undergraduates doing some quadrat work to um, a primary school in this picture. Um, and just finally, um, so like everywhere else in, in the UK, all habitats and particularly ones that are coastal, then obviously climatic change and sea level rise is going to have a huge um, uh, impact um, on areas like Korshochno. Um, as you can see from this map, um, the lighter coloured blue areas are only just uh, above sea level. And the impact of uh, sea level rise is going to be quite dramatic, I would imagine, in the coming um, latter part of, of the current century. So that's something to something to be really concerned about, but something to plan for as well. So you know, it's very much about thinking about um, how can we make the central area of the air, of the site more resilient. I think it's fairly likely that the fringes of the site will um, be inundated um, occasionally or more more frequently perhaps by seawater but it, it's preventing it coming back along those ditches uh, into the central core part of the site that we need to sort of look at and I you know the the edges of Korshochno would have um, had salt water influences historically so it's, it's like, how, how can we work with that um, to protect the site in the future? And obviously, you know, it's all part of a, it's not just about the sort of conservation. There's other, other, other um, interests in the area as well. Um, farming, um, people's, um, where people live and so forth. So there's all these things to, to consider. And it's going to be a, a really difficult time as it is throughout, throughout the world, isn't it? Deciding. What are what are what are the areas that how can we protect some areas? Um, how can we work with natural processes um, to protect habitats, but also to um, make areas more resilient um, for man's activities as well? And sorry, I hope that wasn't too rushed in the end. <laughs> there we go. Thank you very much. So there's a picture of uh, Irish ladies' tresses just going over at the end. <laughs>